a young Batman who's 25 or something. There's no way I could have. I just don't. I feel different from when I was when I was shooting all the Twilight stuff. It's kind of. Yeah, it feels like it's a much more adult character in a lot of ways. Thank you for having me. And you know, Robert, you probably don't know this, but you were my first interview ever in my life with no Twilight. Way. I think the biggest riddle for me was, uh, I think in all of the pre-production stages, the cost, making sure that everything was just right in terms of the costume and who is that person, what does this mask allow them to be, and what could he look like without it, and just setting all the pieces up so that when we were there on the day, uh, that they would hopefully just fall into place. And as well, Matt's script. Mm -hmm. What's the greatest difference you see yourself as a person and as, a, and as an actor from, you know, that guy who did the Twilight audition on volume and now the guy who's playing the Batman? Uh... <sighs> As a person, I think I'm exactly the same. No, no, I've kind of, it's, it does feel different. I mean, it felt like there's something about the, there's something about, um, actually both characters. Like there was, people really, really care about these characters and you kind of always feel a sense of responsibility to, you know, you can't, you can't help but try and make them happy about, you know, as many people as you possibly can. Otherwise it's kind of defeats the purpose of doing it. Um, but with this, it's kind of, I don't think I could have ever played something like this when I was younger. If there was like, if they were doing a reinterpretation of the character saying, oh, it's a young Batman who's 25 or something, there's no way I could have, I just don't, I feel different from when I was, when I was shooting all the Twilight stuff. It's kind of, you know, it feels like it's a much more adult character in a lot of ways. And Zoe, I, like I said before, I really love what you did with this character. And, and it's kind of refreshing to see her caring about other people. But I want to know, do you consider it that, do you consider that a strength or a weakness? I think it's her strength. I think that's literally the reason why she does what she does and why she becomes Catwoman is because she cares. And, um, you know, the, the difference, I think, between this character and the Catwoman that we've seen is that you know, she's really in the middle of a struggle, you know, she's really trying to survive. She's emotionally invested in what's going on. And so she's not really able to enjoy the chaos yet. And I think um, this is kind of the process of her liberating herself from a lot of trauma and a lot of anger, which hopefully will lead to her becoming Catwoman, where she's able to be a bit more playful and have a bit more fun. Having a clue. Let's play a game, just me and you. Any of this mean anything to you? Paul, I want to start with you. How do you commit to a character that does such horrible things? Do you need to kind of justify it in your head and kind of understand why? Uh, yeah, for, for this particular character yes because I think he's actually coming from a deeply emotional deeply wounded deeply angry place I, I I don't think it's just some chemistry is wrong and it's random right his in sense of intent and purpose is very clear so I think yeah getting behind that now of course I I, I, I say that knowing what what you, you know that that what he's doing is not right, of, of course Paul does, but as an actor, you're, you're fiercely uh, committing yourself to this person's wants and needs and desires and emotions and psychology, and that's uh, my job. It's a, it's a strange one, but it's what it is. I think Go that on. everybody justifies their characters because they all have their reasons. Mm -hmm. And sometimes people feel, even the most powerful people, they feel like they're victims of something, that they didn't get something, you know, and they're going to get it by hook or crook, and that's the only way to get it. And once you see other people being corrupt or other people being weak or other people uh, letting go of their uh, values, you say, okay, well, what is, you know, what is there? So I think people do it constantly. 
they do it constantly. And I think part of being civilized is always checking in with yourself mm -hmm. and saying, you know, uh, this is something maybe I shouldn't do. You know what yeah. I mean? And, and once you cross that line, it's like a muscle. You get used to it. Once you cheat, you, you get, get used to, to cheating. It. And once you do something else, you get used to it. And you can still feel like, well, poor me, you know, too. So that's the... And that's why playing villains sometimes can be very uh, freeing because they, they've forgotten those restrictions, mm. you know. They've given them up, uh, you know, so. And I think we like to watch that, maybe not be really around it. You're becoming quite a celebrity. Why is he writing to you? I know Matt Reeves kind of suggested not to consider previous versions of this character. So did you find any difficulties in maybe letting go of the preconception you had on this character? I did know because I, I honestly didn't have any preconception. I mean, I, I had grown up watching, you know, Burgess Meredith, uh, not only in Rocky, but I think before Rocky, even as the Penguin in the Adam West Batman on TV. And I obviously had grown up with Tim Burton's Batman, so I'd seen Danny DeVito's iteration of the penguin but i didn't feel and when i saw the makeup to be honest with you it I, it felt like a new world to me it felt like a completely new world and i had it's very grounded as well and matt was very concerned as a filmmaker with creating a gotham and giving life to characters that were in completely grounded and that everything you saw in the film was possible was believable and was relatable you know so i kind of went from there it was all in the writing and the makeup If you are justice, please do not lie. What is the price for your blind eye? The hell are you supposed to be? You both look badass on screen. I just oh, need to say you. that. <laughs> you really do. You like it, it's funny how you can play that, you know, duo. You know, being emotional and also being a badass. And Rob, I want to ask you because, you know, obviously we find Batman kind of uh, embracing the fact that, the fact that he cannot save everyone. How does that define him as a vigilante and as a superhero, if we can call it like that, in this film? Um. I mean, I think where you find him at the beginning of the story, he's, it's incredibly personal. I mean, he's saying, you know, it's, it, I guess it's the difference between justice and vengeance. He's, you know, this is just, he's kind of, he's on his own trip. Like, and that, and it's kind of, it's, and he's working out, he's just, he's really at the beginning, just trying to get the pain that he, there's this sort of torment that he's had inside his head and he wants to project it out onto other people and thinks that he's so alone that no one else, he thinks he's so disconnected from everyone else in the world, but there's, there, he, he could never have predicted that someone would be inspired by his actions as well. He's just, he thinks he's like kind of in hell doing this stuff. And um, um, yeah, and kind of, and how he is as a vigilante as well. I mean, it's kind of, that's one of the things I loved in the script when, when one of the first fight scenes when he's when on the train platform he beats all the guys up who are who are gonna mug this guy on the train and then once he's beaten them all up it's not like the victim of the original crime is thinking like oh thank you batman <laughs> he's, he's like absolutely he's more afraid of batman and and also there was this kind of there was a moment in the script where he looks at the victim and he doesn't know what to say to make them feel better or anything he's just like the only thing he can understand is is the in, inflicting violence on people and and he doesn't know how to really empathize with them beyond that point and that's kind of his uh, story because to empathize with people you've got to have hope and i think he's been trying to he's been trying to bury any element of hope because it's kind of too painful to him um from his past and i think it kind of starts to open up over the story <laughs> <laughs> Jeffrey, I actually want to ask you, you know, I, I feel like this film and each character has its own conception of justice. What's Gordon's in, in this film? 
Um, that's a good question. Mm. That's a big question. Mm. I think I think that I'm not sure if, if if he's asking a question that large himself. I think there's something about survival, something much simpler, and it's not just his own personal survival, but it's about the survival of the city, and it's about the survival of a of an order that serves the interests of the people that you know he's he's taken on the responsibility to help protect and so uh, maybe that's justice or justness is is at least striving as we talk about in our country striving toward a more perfect place a more perfect union striving toward not a peaceful place necessarily not an ideal place but something better than it is today so towards something more peaceful more just more ordered in 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 a way that serves the interests of the largest um, um, percentage of you know largest of the citizenry I think that's what Gordon is about um, that's a huge question but I think he's a you know he's a working guy and I think he's 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 at uh, something much more kind of utilitarian. You are part of this.